President Dr. John Patillo. <laughs> Dr. Patillo has received an enormous amount of hate mail these past several weeks. And so to counter some of that, I thought I would introduce him by quoting briefly from some of the emails he received from our faculty here at Sacred Heart. And so I quote, Dr. Patillo, we read your letter to the community in our class today, and we are so proud to have such a leader and role model who fearlessly calls out bigotry and hatred when he sees it. End of quote. Another letter, Dr. Patillo, we are so proud to have a leader who is committed to the ideals of dialogue and compassion represented by the Catholic intellectual tradition. And a third, Dr. L Patillo, we thank you for your leadership and your courage by bringing Father Martin to us and to our campus this evening. And so it's my great honor to present to you our president, Dr. John Patillo. Thank you, Michelle. Good thing about it is they did spell my name correctly in all that hate mail. <clears throat> so I'm flattered, flattered by that. It is with a sincere sense of faith and complete message of the Gospels, not only simply select quotes, that I welcome everyone here this evening. Certainly I want to acknowledge our students who appreciate the difference in the value of discovery and dialogue as opposed to indoctrination. I cannot be prouder than to be your president when this turnout is like this. The Catholic intellectual tradition has deep roots securing itself in the journey through the centuries. Aquinas' theology flows from the philosophical perspective perspectives of Plato and Aristotle in their appreciation for the love of truth and intellectual values related to the journey towards that truth. Tonight's lecture is part of that journey out of the cave, as Plato has written, towards the light of justice and respect. I would be remiss if in full disclosure I failed to address the feeble, skewed, and bigoted comments and emails that I have received. As our students and faculty know quite well, bullying is abhorred on this campus in deeds and in words. Bullies have a distorted view of their intellectual competencies. The Gospels are replete with examples of loving and merciful Jesus who spent time, broke bread, and ministered to the marginalized in society and condemned the self-righteous. We have seen in the public square how under the guise of religion and with isolated quotes from holy books, segments of humanity are harassed, harangued, and humiliated. Sectors of three major religions certainly share in those destructive and offensive behaviors. As a university rooted in Catholic tradition, we clearly, unequivocally, and proudly reject the distortions of the Bible and the gospel message. By our stance, by our stance, we also remind ministers of all faiths who remain silent that their silence in face of such brutality is heard with screeching clarity. Stop hiding. Be courageous in the substance of the Gospels. We as a Catholic university want to do more than simply speak of social justice. We want to walk with our, all our brothers and sisters who are victims of hate because of gender, race, or religion. To that end, we will follow tonight's presentation with a four-part discussion series entitled Heart Challenges Hate. That will cover topics ranging from psychology and rhetoric of hate to the First Amendment and to whether religion is a contributor to or a remedy for violence and hatred. 
This series will be our commitment to begin that journey, fearless of the winds that stir around us. And I invite all of you to come back and join in these discussions. In contrast, as Dr. Loris has started to say, in contrast to the early, earlier bigoted emails, I received remarkable support from the university community, for which I am extremely grateful. Especially from parents who learned about tonight's events from their sons and daughters, comments such as, I read your email today through tears. Thank you so much for standing up to the bullies. And I've always been proud of my daughter chose to attend Sacred Heart. Now I'm absolutely over the moon proud. And I will take a two hour drive to be there for this event, to show my support for the university. And from a student, I received a note saying, I'm so proud to be part of this thoughtful community. And from an alumna who I just saw, who met Father Martin eight years ago when he visited campus. So thank you for standing up against bigotry and hate. Our world needs more love and every stance like this brings us one step closer. Jim's message is clear. Strive to love as Christ did. Tonight our guest is also an alumnus as he received an honorary degree from Sacred Heart in 2010. I'm delighted to welcome and introduce Father James Martin who brings with him a legacy of service and devotion to the church through his writings and work. Clearly, he has been recognized as a gifted and talented Jesuit, who, among many other accomplishments, has been recognized for his appointment to the Vatican's Commission on Communication, his address to the World Meeting of Families in Ireland, and his status as editor-at-large in America magazine. As you will witness yourselves, Jim Martin is a man of the gospel, a faithful Catholic minister with the intellectual courage to speak respect and reverence for all God's people, unintimidated by the voices as well as the cowardly silence of hatred. My friends, please join me in welcoming Father Jim Martin. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Loris, uh, for that introduction. And uh, thank you especially, President Patillo, for your bravery, uh, your courage, and also uh, your heart, mirroring the sacred heart. You know, the mural behind me uh, was done, as you probably know, by my Jesuit brother, Marco Rupnik, uh, the great um, artist, the great Jesuit artist. And as we see, the Sacred Heart is pulling people out of the darkness. There's the darkness at the bottom, and that's what heart does. And thank you for pulling us out of the darkness of all that hatred and bigotry. I'm very happy to be back at Sacred Heart. I am an alumnus and a proud alumnus. I am over the moon uh, for being back. And I want to say to all the students here, when you see me at our reunion in 50 years, <laughs> when I'm 108, please be nice to me. So why don't we start with a prayer, how's that? Okay, let's pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Loving God, we thank you for bringing us together under the patronage of your Sacred Heart, your Son's Sacred Heart, as we think about ways of being um, loving and caring and showing your heart to our LGBT brothers and sisters and to one another. Give us a spirit of courage and bravery. And we ask all this through Christ our Lord, amen. amen. So I'd like to talk a little bit, of, let me take my watch off, I don't want to go over the four hour time limit. <laughs> one, of the, um, one of the more recent challenges, which is an understatement, for the Catholic Church and for Catholic institutions, and by that I mean parishes and schools and retreat centers, is how to welcome our LGBT brothers and sisters, as well as families with LGBT members. 
But that challenge is also where a lot of grace abounds. Because LGBT Catholics have felt excluded for, from the church for so long that any experience of welcome can be truly life-changing. A healing moment that inspires them to go to Mass again, return them to the faith, and even help them to, to believe in God again. Over the past few years, I've heard some really appalling stories from LGBT Catholics who have been made to feel unwelcome in their church. Just the other day, I was saying at dinner, uh, there was a woman in a high school in Indianapolis who was fired from her job because she's a lesbian and married to a woman. And as if that isn't bad enough, believe it or not, her father, who had been part of the retreat ministry at that school, was let go recently. So it's not enough that we target the LGBT person, we target their family as well. But, you know, cruelty doesn't end at the doors of a church. Uh, last year, a woman contacted me to ask me if I knew any compassionate priests in her archdiocese, not, not near here, but in the United States. Why? Because she was a nurse in a Catholic hospital where a Catholic patient was dying. And the local priest who was assigned to care for these people who were dying was refusing to anoint the guy simply because he was gay. So is it surprising that LGBT Catholics feel like lepers in their own church? The same can be true for their families. Their families can be made to feel as if they don't belong. The mother of a gay teen told me once that her son had decided to come back to church after a long period of feeling that the church hated him. After much discussion, he decided that he would return on Easter Sunday. The mother was overjoyed, right? So the, the young man is maybe like senior in high school, I think, or a freshman in college, young, a young guy, young for me. Um, and she said that they picked, actually it was kind of funny, she said we picked a late mass so he would be more likely to go. Um, you know, the 11 o'clock mass on Easter Sunday. So when mass began, she told me she was so excited to have her son sitting next to her, holding her hand. You know, you can imagine, she'd been praying for all this time. But after the priest proclaimed the story of Christ's resurrection on Easter Sunday morning, guess what he preached on? The evils of homosexuality and same-sex marriage. The son stood up, let go of the mother's hand, and walked out of the church. And the mother sat in her pew and cried. But there are also stories of grace in the church. Last year, a university student, this was at Villanova, a place where people go when they can't get into Sacred Heart. Um, <laughs> at that other school, <laughs> at least I didn't say Fairfield. Um, <laughs> no, it, it, it did happen in Villanova. This, this kid came up to me at a book signing uh, and said, you know, the very first person I came out to, said this kid, was a priest. And the first thing the priest said to him was, quote, God loves you and the church accepts you. And the young man told me, he looked at me and he said, that saved my life. So you can imagine what, his, what was going through his mind. So we should rejoice that more and more Catholic parishes are places where LGBT Catholics can feel at home. Thanks to both the parish staff and formalized programs, the same is true for example, at Sacred Heart, where LGBT kids can feel welcome, right? Thanks to the administration, the faculty, and the staff. My own Jesuit community in New York City is next to a church called St. Paul the Apostle, which has one of the most active LGBT outreach programs in the world. The ministry is called Out at St. Paul. I know, that always gets a laugh. I don't know why, but... Um, <laughs> And it sponsors retreats, Bible study programs, spe uh, speaking engagements, and social events for the parish's large LGBT community. And at every 515 Mass, when the time comes for parish announcements, uh, an LGBT person gets up in the pulpit and says, Hi, I'm Jason or Jorge or Marianne, and I'm a member of Out at St. Paul. If you're lesbian, gay, or bisexual, we want you to feel welcome. Here are some events that for coming up this week. Sadly, much of the spiritual life of LGBT Catholics and their families depends, if you ever think about this, on where they happen to live. You ever think about that? If you are gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender, or queer Catholic, trying to make sense of your relationship with God and the church, 
and, or if you are the parent of an LGBT person, and you live in a big city with open-minded pastors, or you're near somewhere like uh, Sacred Heart, you are in luck, right? You're in luck. You can come here for Mass and feel welcome. But if you happen to live in a less open-minded place, or your pastor is homophobic, either silently or overtly, you are out of luck. And the way Catholics are welcomed or not welcomed in Catholic institutions like parishes and high schools and colleges heavily influences their outlook on not only the church, but on their faith, right? And on God. That is a scandal to me. We talk about scandals in the church. There are many. This is another scandal. Why should people's faith depend on where they happen to live? Is that what God really desires for the church? Do you think that Jesus wanted people in Bethany to feel God's love less than people in Bethsaida? Do you think Jesus wanted a woman in Jericho to feel God's love less than a woman in Jerusalem? So what helps our Catholic institutions, our parishes and schools be more welcoming and respectful? How can priests and deacons, presidents and principals, teachers, faculty members, sisters and brothers, directors of religious education, lay pastoral associates, and all Catholics help our church become more of a home for LGBT Catholics and their families? The following observations are based not only on conversations with LGBT Catholics, but also the experience of LGBT ministries and outreach programs that I consulted for this talk in high schools and colleges and parishes. I asked them, what is the most important thing for people to know? Okay, so I'd like to talk about three areas. First, what are some fundamental insights for Catholic institutions? Second, what can a Catholic institution do to be more welcoming and respectful? Finally, what might the gospel say to us about this rather new ministry? Let's begin with six Fundamental insights. Number one, they're Catholic. Okay? That may sound obvious, but Catholic institutions need to remember that LGBT people and their families are baptized Catholics. They're as much a part of the church as Pope Francis, as Bishop Caggiano, as your local pastor, right? As President Patillo, or as your pastor or me. So it's not a question of making them Catholic. They already are. So the most important thing that we might be able to do for LGBT Catholics is to welcome them into what is already their church. And remember, just to remain in the church, they have had to endure often years of persecution and rejection. So our welcome should reflect that, right? And should try to make up for that, those years of rejection. Number two, they do not choose their orientation. Sadly, many people still believe that people choose their sexual orientation, despite the testimony of almost every single psychologist, psychiatrist, social scientist, and biologist, and more importantly, the lived experience and testimony of LGBT people themselves. You do not choose your orientation any more than you choose to be left-handed. It's not a choice, and it's not an addiction. Thus, it is not a sin to be LGBTQ. Far less is it something to blame on people, like parents. Number three, they have often been treated as lepers by the church. Never underestimate the terrible pain that LGBTQ people have experienced, not only at the hands of the church, but from society at large. A few statistics may help. In the United States, lesbian, gay, and bisexual youth are five times as likely to have attempted suicide than their straight counterparts, five times. 40% of transgender people in this country, 40% attempt suicide. One study shows also that, get this, the more religious the family they come from, the more likely they are to commit to try to attempt suicide. So for people who come from religious families who are straight, that diminishes the percentage, right? But if you're LGBT and you come from a religious family, it increases the percentage that you will attempt suicide. And one important reason that LGBT youth are homeless is because they come from families who reject them for religious reasons. 
So the church and Catholic institutions need to be aware of the consequences of stigmatizing LGBT people. Many LGBT Catholics have been deeply wounded by the church. They may have been mocked, insulted, excluded, condemned, or singled out for critique either privately or sometimes from the pulpit. They may have never heard the term gay or lesbian expressed in any positive way at all, even in a neutral way. From their earliest days as Catholics, they are often made to feel like they are a mistake. They fear rejection, judgment, and condemnation from the church. In fact, these may be the only things that they expect from the church. This often leads them to exclude themselves from their church. Parents often face similar pain. There is a saying, when a child comes out of the closet, the parent goes into the closet. It can be confusing, frightening, and embarrassing for parents even today to accept the reality of their children's orientation or gender identity. They may suffer shame in front of family and friends. Sometimes, this one woman said to me, it's really poignant, she said, I, I felt that I had to choose between my child and God. Parents also worry that their children will leave a church that is seen as rejecting them. As a result, Catholic institutions need to let parents and families know that they are welcome too, that they have nothing to fear from the church, and that the church is their home. Four, they bring gifts to the church. Do you ever think about that? LGBT people, like any group, bring special gifts to the church as a community. Now, I know it's wrong to generalize, right? We don't want to say all LGBT people are like this or all this kind of group of people are like this. But I think for a group that has been seen in the church almost exclusively in a negative light, it's important to consider their positive gifts that they bring. So what might those gifts bring? Well, to begin with, because they have been so marginalized, many LGBT people often feel a natural compassion for people on the margins. So, compassion is a gift, right? Do we doubt that? This compassion is a gift to the church. They are often forgiving of pastors and priests who have treated them like dirt. Their forgiveness is a gift, and they persevere. I mean, think of what it's like to be an LGBT person, to choose to be in the church. They persevere despite all of this. Their perseverance is a gift. In fact, recently, some American institutions, Catholic institutions like parishes and schools, have fired LGBT people after they were legally married, as you probably have read. And I have to say, something about these situations always mystified me, truly. Every time I would hear these stories, they would always be about the most beloved teacher, the most beloved uh, you know, director of religious education, the most beloved coach, and, you know, I, I work uh, at America Magazine, which is, you know, where I'm in the media technically, and I think, well, that's probably just sort of like a little bit of hype. You know, how could they always be the most beloved? But then it dawned on me. LGBT people working for the church really have to want to be there, right? I mean, they really have to want to be there despite the way that they're, they're treated. They stick with that ministry despite the rejection they experience. That's why they're the most beloved. It's the same with LGBT parishioners. They have to make a conscious decision to stay with the church, to persevere. That perseverance is a gift. Think about their faith, the faith that it takes to do that. Five, they long to know God. Like many Catholics, many LGBT people struggle with various aspects of the church's teaching, okay? At the same time, Many of them are not focused on those parts of the tradition as people think. Many want something simpler. They want to experience the Father's love through community. They want to meet Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. They want to experience the Holy Spirit in the sacraments. They want to hear a good homily for a change, right? <laughs> they want music they can sing. They want to feel part of a faith community. So we need to treat them like that. Not as protesters, but as parishioners. We need to help LGBT people and their families fulfill their deepest desires, which is everyone's deepest desire, to know God. Finally, six. They are loved by God. God loves them. Let me repeat that. God loves them. So should we. 
And I don't mean a stingy, grudging, judgmental, conditional, half-hearted love. I mean love. And what does that mean? The same thing it means for everyone, knowing them in the complexity of their lives, celebrating them when life is sweet, suffering them, suffering with them when life is bitter, as any friend would. With those insights in mind, how can Catholic institutions become more welcoming? How can we treat LGBT people with the virtues that the Catechism recommends, respect, compassion, and sensitivity? You know, it's funny, I said that a couple months ago, I said, we need to treat them with respect, compassion, and sensitivity. And this guy jumped up and said, where does that come from? I said, the catechism. He was like, oh, okay. Let me suggest 10 things. Now, the following suggestions need to be fitted to different Catholic institutions. You know, what works at Sacred Heart might not work in a parish in the Bronx. What works in a parish in the Bronx might not work in a, a Catholic high school in San Diego, for example. So... Every group must develop its own model. Okay, number one, examine your own attitudes towards LGBT people and their families. Do you believe that someone is sinful simply because she's a lesbian or more inclined to sin than a straight woman? Do you hold the parents responsible for a gay teen's orientation? Do you think a person, here's a popular one, is transgender only because it's fashionable now? Here's another question someone asked me. I love this. This is for uh, uh, Catholic school administrators and, and uh, pastors. If none or only a few LGBT people have made themselves known to you, why might that be the case? Likewise, are you discriminating against them in your heart? For example, do you hold the LGBT community to the same standards as the straight community? With LGBT people, we tend to focus on whether they are fully conforming to the church's teaching on sexual morality. Okay, are you doing the same thing with straight parishioners? And straight Catholics? With those who are living together before being married? With those who are practicing birth control? Be consistent about whose lives get scrutinized. We are often more sympathetic to the complex situations, we were talking about this at dinner, of straight people because we know them better. For example, even though Jesus condemns divorce outright, most parishes and Catholic schools welcome divorced people. Do we treat LGBT people with the same understanding? What can you do about these attitudes? Be honest about them. But get facts, not myths, about sexual orientation from scientific and social scientific sources, not from rumors and misinformed and homophobic websites. Then talk to God or a friend about your feelings, or a spiritual mentor, and be open to God's response. This leads to the next step. Here's a big one for the church. Listen to them. How about that? Listen to the experiences of LGBT Catholics and their parents and families. We're not a good listening church. We're a great teaching church. We're not a great listening church. If you don't know what to say, you might ask, what was it like growing up as a gay boy in the church? What is it like being a lesbian Catholic? And an important question today, because we are still coming to understand this complex phenomenon, what is it like being a transgender person? What is that like? We know so little about that experience, so we have to listen. Invite the parents of an LGBT child to speak with your institution. Ask them, what is it like to have a gay child? How has the church helped or hurt you? And pay attention to what they say. Be attentive to the language, too, that they find needlessly hurtful. Names, words, and terminology matter. Overall, when participating in a ministry like an LGBT outreach program or meeting with LGBT people one-on-one, -on -one, begin with their experiences. I mean, notice how Jesus treats people on the margins. How he treats, remember the Samaritan woman, the woman at the well? Does he castigate her for being married several times? She says she's been married five times and, and presumably living with someone, according to the gospel. No, he listens to her and treats her with respect. So be like Jesus. Listen, encounter, accompany. If the church listened to LGBT people, 90% of the homophobia and prejudice would disappear. Three, acknowledge them as full members of your institution without judgment and not as fallen away Catholics. For example, in, in, in a parish, LGBT people should never be degraded or humiliated from the pulpit, nor should anybody. 
you know, sometimes when I'm spe- uh, preaching, um, I'll say, to sort of include everyone, I'll say something like, you know, God loves us all, you know, young or old, rich or poor, tall or short, LGBT or straight. You know, something small like that sends a signal to people. And by the way, it also sends a signal to their parents and grandparents. Pastor told me, you know, he says to other pastors, you may not think that you have any LGBT people in your church, and that may be true, but you certainly have parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles of LGBT people in your church. Remember that when you're speaking about LGBT people, you're speaking about their family. Four, apologize to them. If LGBT Catholics or their families have been harmed in the name of the church by homophobic comments and attitudes and decisions, apologize. And that goes for everyone who works in any sort of Catholic institution. You, by virtue of your jobs, are all ministers of the church. You represent the church to them. If they were harmed by the church, you can apologize. It doesn't solve everything, but it's a start. Five, don't reduce gays and lesbians to the call to chastity that we all share as Christians. LGBT people are more than their sexual lives, but sometimes that's all they hear about from the church. That's it. Remember not to focus solely on sexuality, but on the many other joys and sorrows in their lives. They lead rich lives like everybody. Many LGBT people are parents themselves, or caring for aging parents. They help the poor in their community. They're involved in their alma maters. They're involved in civic and charitable organizations. They're often deeply involved in the life of their parish. So see them in their totality. And if you want to talk incessantly about chastity and celibacy with LGBT people, do it as much with your straight friends. See how far that gets you. (laughs) Six, include them in ministries. As I mentioned, there is a tendency to focus on the sexual morality of LGBT people, which is wrong because first, you have no idea what their sexual lives are like. And second, even if they are falling short, they're not the only ones. As a result, LGBT people may feel that they have to be dishonest about who they are and they have no place in ministry in the church anywhere. Like everyone else in the church who does not live up to the Gospels, which is everyone, right? LGBT people should be invited into church ministries. Eucharistic ministers, music ministers, lector, bereavement ministers, Catholic school teachers, every ministry. And by the way, by not welcoming them into the church, we are missing out on their gifts. They will simply go to where they are welcome and where they can bring their whole selves. Seven, acknowledge their individual gifts. Not only should we acknowledge the gifts of LGBT people as a group, they're not just this sort of faceless mass of people, we should acknowledge their individual gifts because they've been ignored individually so long. For example, um, one of the cantors in my Jesuit parish in New York, St. Ignatius, called St. Ignatius, big surprise, um, is a gay man. He is a kind and compassionate person, and his beautiful voice have made him an essential part of our worship for 20 years. You probably have similar people that you know in Catholic schools and parishes and retreat houses. Remember how important it is to acknowledge them, to praise them, to raise them up. Don't hide their light under your bushel basket. Eight, invite everyone on your team to welcome them. Take a parish, for example. You may have a welcoming pastor, but what about everybody else? I love these questions. Uh, 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 Someone who worked at a Catholic parish suggested these to me. Does the person answering the phone at the parish know what to say to a lesbian couple who wants to have their child baptized? At funerals, are the gay adult children of the deceased treated with the same respect as other children? What about the teacher in a parish school who has two fathers coming to a parish teacher conference? How does a deacon treat the father of a gay man who has just died and wanted once a funeral? Are gay and lesbian couples welcome in parish bereavement groups when a partner dies? Are the children of lesbian and gay couples welcome in parish schools, high schools, educational programs, and sacramental preparation programs? The voice of the church, the voice of your parish, is not just the voice of your pastor, but everybody everyone's voice. Think of it this way. By not welcoming, by excluding LGBT Catholics, the church is falling short of its call to be God's family. 
You are tearing apart God's family. You are breaking apart the body of Christ. Nine, sponsor special events and develop an outreach program. Like everybody else, LGBT Catholics want to feel like they are part of the church. And as for all its children, the onus is on the church to invite them into the community. But for many LGBT people, the church has not been a place of welcome. So specific programs are needed to bridge that gap between your good intentions and their suspicions, right? Their experiences. <clears throat> Excuse me. As for events, there are many possibilities. A massive welcome, special colloquia, a day of recollection, a book club, a speaker. And speaking events don't have to focus on LGBT issues. Invite a speaker to talk to LGBT Catholics about prayer. As for parents, one mother said when I asked what I should say to you today, I love this quote. This is a quote from her. The most important thing is to give parents a safe, welcoming space to share their stories with other Catholic parents. So many feel alone and, I don't, and don't think anyone else is going through this. It's a relief to know that other people are with you on the journey. And they don't need to hear their children being compared to alcoholics. Hearing positive statements from the pulpit would also be nice instead of acting as if their children don't exist. Finally, 10, advocate for them. Be prophetic. Sacred Heart has been prophetic in the last few weeks. There are times when the church can provide a moral voice for this persecuted community. And I'm not talking about hot button issues like same sex marriage. I'm talking about incidents in countries where gay men are rounded up and thrown in jail or even executed for being gay. Did you know that? You can be executed for being gay in eight countries. You can be jailed in 72 countries. There are countries where lesbians are, believe it or not, raped to cure them of their sexual orientation. In these countries, think about it, LGBT issues are life issues. The church is fond of talking about, as it should, life issues, right? Talking about LGBT teen suicides and people being executed for being gay. These are life issues for the church. In other countries, like our country, it may be more responding to incidents of suicides, as I've said, or hate crimes and bullying. There are many opportunities for, for Catholic institutions to stand with LGBT people who are being persecuted. That's part of social justice. Standing with people who are on the margins, going to the peripheries, as Pope Francis said. The Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith wrote in 1986, believe it or not, 1986, it is deplorable that homosexual persons have been and are the object of violent speech and action. Such treatment deserves condemnation from the church's pastors whenever it occurs. And yet, when do you hear the church standing up for people? This is part of what it means to be a Christian, my brothers and sisters, to stand up for the marginalized, the persecuted, the beaten down. It's shocking how little the Catholic Church has done this. Let LGBT Catholics and LGBT people in general know that you stand with them. Be prophetic, be courageous, be like Jesus, be like the guy behind me. Because if we're not trying to be like him, what's the point? What are we doing here? And remember that in his public ministry, Jesus continually reached out to people who felt like they were on the margins, who felt like they were in the dark. The movement for Jesus is from the outside in, right? He's pulling, that more? He's pulling people in. Because for Jesus, there's no us and them, right? There's no us and there's no us and there's no one who's other. There's no one who's other in that mural. He's pulling them in. There's only us. So to that end, I'd like to close with one story from the Gospels to help us meditate on our call to welcome and respect LGBT people and their families. Then I'd like to answer your questions. Um, and I want to talk to you about the story of Zacchaeus. Raise your hands if you know who Zacchaeus is from the Gospels. Raise your hands. OK. So not many. Um, so Zacchaeus in the Gospel of Luke, it's a great story. Jesus is going through the town of Jericho, okay? Jericho is a huge town. It would have been about uh, 30 or 40,000 people, all right? It's towards the end of Jesus' ministry. 
Who is in Jericho? A man named Zacchaeus, Z-A-C-C-H-A-E-U-S, Zacchaeus. He is described as the chief tax collector in Jericho. Okay, now the chief tax collector at the time would have been seen as the chief sinner. Why? Because he would have been colluding with Roman authorities, right? He's seen as the guy who's collecting money for the Romans. Jesus is going through Jericho. And I would like you to see Zacchaeus as an emblem of the LGBT person. Not because LGBT people are any more sinful than anybody else, we're all sinners, but because he's the most marginalized person in town. The Gospel of Luke describes Zacchaeus as short in stature. Okay, now that obviously refers to his height. How often do LGBT people feel they have little stature in the church? Okay, so there's Zacchaeus. Jesus is coming into town. He's surrounded with hundreds of followers. Luke says that Zacchaeus could not see Jesus on account of the crowd. Okay, so you have that picture in your mind, the short guy? Now, that's referring to his height and him not being able to see Jesus on account of the crowd. But how often do we, as the crowd, the church, get in the way of LGBT people being able to see Jesus? So what does Zacchaeus do? Does anybody remember? He climbs a tree. Oh, see, more people than them. The people are so shy. I forgot I'm at college. Does anybody know? You know who Zacchaeus is. So he climbs a tree. Actually, he climbs a sycamore tree. Funny enough, if you go to Jericho today, um, I, I take a, I'm going in a couple weeks, I take a pilgrimage uh, with, with a lot of people. Uh, there's a tree in the middle of the town square, a sycamore tree in the middle of Jericho, which is called, of course, the Zacchaeus tree. And you know, everybody takes pictures. And I was there a couple years ago, and one of the pilgrims said, you know, it's a great big tree. They said, Father Jim, is that the tree that Zacchaeus? And I was like, oh. <laughs> And someone said, well, it could be 2,000 years old. And another pilgrim said, well, yeah, but if it was 2,000 years old, at Jesus' time, it would have been this big. <laughs> so they're like, yeah, it might be the tree. Um, so anyway, so Zacchaeus climbs the tree. Because he, why, according to Luke, it's so beautiful. He wanted to see who Jesus was. Isn't that beautiful? That's what LGBT people want. He has to do something that makes him vulnerable. He climbs a tree, something that would look kind of ungainly and even ridiculous. He literally goes out on a limb to see Jesus, right? That's what, think of, think of him as the LGBT person, just trying his best to see Jesus. Jesus comes into Jericho, hundreds of people around him. It's towards the end of his ministry, he would have been very well known. Who does he call to? Does he call to one of the religious authorities? Does he call to one of the rabbis? Does he call to one of the, you. He says, hurry down from that tree. It's so beautiful, for I must stay at your house today. Isn't that amazing? Zacchaeus comes down, and my favorite line in the whole gospel story, and all who saw it began to grumble. Right? That's what's happening today. That's what you were experiencing. That's what you see out there with the protesters. That's what you see online. Extending mercy to people who are seen as other makes people angry. All who saw it began to grumble. And by the way, I talked to a a New Testament scholar about this recently, and he said, by the way, all, the Greek word is panta, includes the disciples. They don't like the fact that Jesus is talking to someone on the margins. But Zacchaeus comes down the tree and says he stood there. The Greek is stronger, stathes. He stood his ground. That's what LGBT people have to do, right? In the face of all that grumbling, outside, they stand their ground in the church. And he has this moment of conversion. He says to Jesus, anyone I have defrauded, I will repay four times over, and I will give half my money to the poor. What is going on? An encounter with Christ always produces a conversion. And I don't mean conversion therapy, right? I mean what the Gospels call metanoia, Metanoia, a change of mind and heart. We're all called to conversion. And Jesus says, today salvation has come to this house. It's an amazing story. That's how Jesus treats people on the margins who feel like they're on the outs. Like that, with respect, compassion, and sensitivity.
So it seems to me that there are two places to stand. Because notice that Jesus doesn't say, oh, you sinner, you reprobate, you terrible person. He says, come down. Come down from that tree. Stand with me. There's two places to stand. You can stand with the crowd who grumbles and who opposes an offer of mercy to people on the margins. Or you can stand with Zacchaeus, and more importantly, you can stand with Jesus. Thank you very much. Thank you, Father Martin. Thank you so much for carrying the conversation forward, for moving our hearts and our minds. So if you have questions, move them to the center, and some people will come to collect them. But let me start with this last thing that you said. Why, why um, and it's one of the questions that one of the students asked in class today, why does it make people afraid to do the thing that Jesus would want to do, move to the margins, to be merciful, but it makes the church and other people in society resistant, afraid, reactionary, why? So I'll give a sort of straightforward answer and then maybe a more theological answer. And you're gonna laugh. The straightforward answer is that people can be jerks. <laughs> I mean, there's no way around it. People can be mean, right? The theological answer is, I think, uh, that it, it's very easy for us to uh, create someone who is an other, someone who's different, someone who's not like us. We marginalize people. We marginalize the LGBT person. We marginalize people of color. We marginalize uh, migrants and refugees. They're other. They're different. They're a threat to us. Uh, that comes primarily from fear, fear of the other, fear of uh, something different, fear of change. And then frequently, um, it is um, fear of our own um, complicated sexuality, right? So it's, it's stuff that's going on inside of us. And it's really um, divisive in the church, uh, and it, it is exactly the opposite of what Jesus wants to do. Um, and I think, unfortunately, people have been taught, in, maybe not uh, sort of overtly, but sort of subliminally, that it is okay to hate LGBT people. Uh, and. It's okay to reject them because they're all sinners. And you know, we're all, I mean, everybody's a sinner. And the idea that the LGBT person is the greatest sinner to me has always been shocking. Uh, so yeah, so it's, it's kind of the otherizing uh, of the person and the demonizing of the person. And you know, we see that in terms of, to take another, I would not neutral example, but outside of the realm of LGBT people, like migrants and refugees who are called animals and vermin and you know, we see what happens in history when people are treated like that. If they are animals or vermin, it's easier to treat them poorly and lock them up and mistreat them. And so if LGBT people are always and everywhere sinners, it's, it's, it's easy to exclude them rather than include them, which is Jesus' message. It's hard sometimes, you know, to, to sort of accept people who are different from yourselves. And we talk a lot about that in the CIT seminars. Something else that you talked about, which was... Um, the sexuality piece of the LGBT person, that that seems to be the thing that creates fear more than, let's say, premarital sex or something like that. And at dinner tonight, we were talking about how that may open up questions that the church may not feel comfortable talking about. Yeah, uh, so, you know, the, the, the complicated, topic of sexuality uh, means that uh, when it is raised, one has to talk about one's own sex, or one has to think about one's own sexuality. And so I think when you see online, the people oftentimes that are most opposed to this kind of ministry are people who, for example, are ex-gays, for example, uh, or people who just seem themselves to be, I mean, I can't look in their hearts, but they seem themselves to be upset or confused about their own sexuality. In the church, one of the reasons, and we should say this, you know, there's a cover story in New York Magazine, one of the reasons I think it's hard for church leaders to talk about sexuality is because of their own sexuality. 
right? You know, you will have many, and, and not to say they're sexually active, but you know, you have many priests and bishops and cardinals, church leaders who themselves are gay, you know, and, and even if they're perfectly celibate and chaste, are uncomfortable with that. And so the idea that this would be something that we would talk about would mean that they would have to be for, forced to look at this themselves, which to them is, to use a theological term, anathema. And so much better to keep it out there. No pun intended. <laughs> so one of the things that, um, one of the questions has to do with, um, is respect, compassion, and sensitivity enough? Is, is there a need maybe for the church to even go further? Is that something? Yeah, so I, I want to be clear. I'm not challenging any church teaching uh, up here or in my book. Um, I, I think, yes, the church needs to go much further. Respect, compassion, and sensitivity are kind of the baseline. I think the problem, though, <laughs> is that, as you can see from protesters and online and, you know, President Patilla's uh, negative emails, even that is too much for people. I mean, the idea that respect, compassion, and sensitivity would somehow provoke these you know, insane responses shows you how far we have to go. So basically, that's step one. And that's what I'm trying to do, just to get this dialogue going, just to get people in the room together and to treat one another with, with dignity that they deserve. And so the church does need to go a lot further, but we're still at, you know, we're still at step one. So here's one. Um, how is it possible to navigate conversations that stir compassion and understanding as you have done tonight when the actual language of the church remains negative and places LGBT orientation in terms of a natural disorder? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think one of the most uh, hurtful things, well, LGBT people tell me that some of the most hurtful things about the church are the language that it uses to describe them. So for example, intrinsically disordered or objectively disordered. And I think the church has to listen to the reactions of LGBT people to whom this teaching is primarily directed. And I'll tell you one story that just blows my mind every time I think about it. These are, these are not made up stories. Um, I was at um, a university, also not as good a university as Sacred Heart. Um, I was at a university and uh, this mother came up to me and said, do the people who write the catechism know what language like intrinsically disordered could do to a 14-year-old boy? It could destroy him. Now, prescinding whether or not we think that the, the, these, these categories are accurate, we must listen to that woman's voice. And so the church must hear her in a way that it has not been open to hearing her. So that's, that's the, I'm, I'm really looking for a, I think it's Ecclesia Decens, is it? The teaching church, and Ecclesia Docens, the listening church. There are two here that are really, um, I think. What would you suggest to grandparents and parents who are extremely religious um, but prejudiced against LGBT, how would you help them to accept their gay children? That's a great, that's a great question. Um, hmm. You know, I'm tempted to just say love them. I should probably just stop there. Um, listen to them. You know, it's really interesting to me. I, I know this sounds crazy, but I, I know this does. I, I don't know why. Grandparents seem to have less of a problem with it than parents do. It's the strangest thing, and I think it's the kind of unique relationship that grandparents have with their, their grandchildren, but I've had so many grandparents come up to me and say, oh, Father, I love my child, and it's kind of charming. They struggle with the terminology, you know, he, she, she's a, he, he's a, uh, well, you know, whatever you call them, and, <laughs> and, you know, you can see these people trying, but I would say, you know, kidding aside, I would say for those who have difficulty, Oftentimes, they're reading the, 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 the Bible in a very literalistic way, and in a way that we don't read other passages from the Bible. So you like, well, Leviticus says that, you know, uh, you know that, 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 that this is an abomination. I say, well, Leviticus also says that, you know, if you plant two kinds of crops next to one another, you should be stoned to death, right? And they say, well, we don't do that anymore. That's ridiculous. We have to understand in context. And I say, yeah, exactly. 
So that's the first thing, to kind of look at how you're interpreting the scriptures. Second thing is just to listen to their experiences. I think that this generation, I mean, this is mostly young people here, your generation, believe it or not, knows more about this topic than your parents and grandparents. So strangely, you, all the young people here, are the teachers of your elders in this. And so it's a question of can you compassionately teach and invite into your world and your way of looking at things your elders, your parents and your grandparents. That's an act of compassion. Right? That, that itself is a compassionate act. Okay, maybe this, maybe this is the last question. It has three parts. <laughs> How did you start your journey on, the, on this topic? What has been your biggest challenge in your work? And um, this morning um, and today, there are protesters at our school. How do you manage all that hate and backlash that you get? So how did you start the journey? What's the biggest challenge in your work? And how do you manage the backlash? Yeah, sure. Okay, wow. It's like an exam question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how did I start the journey? Um, well, I was born in 1960. <laughs> now, I, so like most uh, faculty, priests, lay associates, anybody who works in the church, I know LGBT people and I counsel them and minister to them and, you know, spiritual direction, confession, whatnot. And I would write about that topic occasionally in America Magazine, you know, from time to time. Uh, but then in 2016, uh, when 49 gay people were killed at the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, Florida, you remember that? I noticed that very, like a handful of bishops said anything. And as you know, when there's ever a shooting or any sort of tragedy like that, the bishops say something, which is right. I mean, really, like after a shoot, boom, you know, an hour later, we stand with the people of Whatever city, sadly, there's so many shootings these days. We stand with the people of Texas. We stand with the people, you know, <coughs> immediately. And they didn't do that for Orlando, which was at the time the largest mass shooting in U.S. history, 49 people. I couldn't believe it. And so I, I, I have a public Facebook page, and I posted a very quick video that got a lot of hits. Um, and then... I was invited by a group called New Ways Ministry that advocates and ministers for LGBT Catholics to give this talk called the Bridge Building uh, Talk. And by the way, at every step I, just this is important I think for people to know, at every step I asked the permission of my Jesuit superiors and at every step they said yes. Yes, you can go to that talk. Here's the talk. Yes, you can give that talk. And that grew into a book. They approved the book, which by the way has been endorsed by cardinals and archbishops and bishops. Yes, yes, yes. So I thought it was important to do it within the church, right? Um, and so uh, that led to the book, which led to this kind of ministry. Um, by the way, funny enough, the, the Superior General of the Society of Jesus, who's this great guy, he's Venezuelan named Arturo Sosa, through uh, someone, because he doesn't pick up the phone and call me every day, um, <laughs> just on Sundays. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> he said, um, which is kind of funny, so the book is called Building a Bridge, and it's on sale, and I recommend it for your friends and family. Um, and Father Sosa said, if you're going to be a bridge, expect to be walked over but from both sides, So, which is kind of a good image. So the biggest challenge, I think, was this um, kind of hateful pushback. There were kind of three stages to the book. One was this kind of adulation, which surprised me because the book is pretty mild. You know, I think if a lot of you young people read it, you'll say, well, what's the big, I don't get it, what's, what's the controversy? Um, so there was this kind of crazy adulation and, uh, you know, packed churches and people crying, and that was kind of a surprise. And it dawned on me that, you know, people wanted to hear this message. And I think having someone in a collar say this was different for them. But then the second wave was some really, really hateful personal attacks articles, videos. Uh, there's a website called Church Militant that has, I think, I think 20 videos about me and how horrible I am. Father Martin's a heretic, Father Martin's a liar. 
The new word is I'm a homosexualist. I don't know what that means. Um, <laughs> So really, very hateful, and I guess the thing that surprised me was personal. I mean, you can say, I disagree with the book, and I don't, but I mean personal. He should be kicked out of the priesthood. So it was very hateful, very homophobic. Um, and then there was the third wave, which was people pushing back against that. So people like Cardinal Supich, the Archbishop of Chicago, invited me to give a talk, Archbishop Gregory in Atlanta, the World Meeting of Families. I was invited to give a talk by the Vatican, believe it or not, called which was similar to this talk, showing respect and welcome in our parishes to LGBT people. The Vatican, I couldn't believe it. So there's this kind of battle going on. And that surprised me, the kind of, the, sort of the personal vilification. How do I deal with it? Well, okay, a few ways. Um, one is, look, not everybody's gonna like you, right? I mean, they didn't like this guy, right? He was pretty nice. <laughs> look. The last, the last two, three days in the Gospels, the last two, three days in the Gospels in Mark, what happens? Believe it or not, there's a passage that said that Jesus was healing and preaching in Capernaum by the Sea of Galilee. Now, we don't as Catholics remember this part of the Gospels. And his relatives, I'm not making this stuff up. This is third chapter of Mark. His relatives came to seize him or arrest him because they thought he was out of his mind, his family from Nazareth. So that's the first part of Mark 3. The second part, he's in the synagogue, and the people say he's possessed by a demon. His family shows up, his mother and his brothers, okay, his extended family, and they come to seize him, and Jesus says, who are my mothers and brothers? Okay, so what's going on in that passage? His family thinks he's crazy. The religious leaders think he's possessed, right? So not everybody's gonna like you all the time, right? So that's the first thing, you have to get over that. Second of all, I realized, look, um, I have the support of my religious authorities. I have the support of cardinals and archbishops in the church. When I go to places like this, 95, 97, 98% of the people are very happy to hear it. I meet LGBT people who are desperate to hear it. And so what if there's a few people online or even a few bishops and even a cardinal or two that doesn't like it, right? I mean, what kind of a Jesuit would I be if I stopped preaching a message of welcome to the margins? So I'm gonna share with you. Uh, there's also what Jesuits call the grace of indifference the grace of being free of the need to be liked, to be approved of, to be loved. And I will share with you, maybe uh, as a way of ending, I will share with you my mantra. And maybe this will help you when people uh, oppose you for doing the right thing, or, or people don't like you, or approve of you, or love you. And when I see those protesters, here's my two-word mantra, and it is, who cares? <laughs> so, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much for the grace and the love that you bring to our community. Father Martin is uh, gonna be available to um, sign his book in the back and maybe if you have a quick question, he might answer it, but come get his book. Thank you for your love, thank you.